Ooh, let's talk some worms. Okay, for this last section of this chapter, we're going to be looking at gastrointestinal infections caused by helmets. Why do we separate out the helmets from the other microorganisms? Uh, because helmets are multicellular organisms. Everything we've talked of about up till now have been single cell organisms, bacteria, protozoa, such as, you know, giardia, the amoebas, or viral. Now we're talking multicellular organisms. Going to see that they're going to be split into three categories. Nematodes, also you'll see referred to as roundworms. Trematodes, flukes, liver fluke, lung fluke, and then the cestodes, better known as the tapeworms. One of the key things about our body's response to helminth parasitic infection is what is referred to as eosinophilia. The eosinophils are one of the white blood cells that comes into play when there is a parasitic infection, a multicellular parasite specifically, okay? Eosinophils do not phagocytize like macrophages and neutrophils do. What eosinophils do is they release their granules, okay? They're, if you study, um, you know, blood cells, you look go and you look at the blood cells, you will see that some of them look like they have a lot of little spots in them. Eosinophils are the ones that have lots of spots and they call those granules. Those granules are digestive enzymes that are will be released onto the surface of a multicellular parasite so that the parasite gets broken down, digested, broken into pieces that macrophages, neutrophils can come, phagocytize, present to B cells, T cells, and start the adaptive immune response. When we look at the helmets, there are two roots, general roots that we recognize for infection. Fecal oral, you ingest eggs, or you ingest some organism that's already infected with a larval stage of a helminth, or the second penetration of the skin. Some of the helminths have a larval stage that will adhere to and then burrow through our skin to get into the underlying tissues, to get into the bloodstream, to make it to, you know, our stomach, our livers, wherever, and then goes into our gastrointestinal tract. We're going to see that of all the organisms we're going to talk about, roundworms, flatworms, the tapeworms, whatever, that they're going to spend part of their life cycle in our gastrointestinal tract so that we will ex pass out eggs or a larval stage, which will then go and infect some other organism for the next larval stages to occur and the next and the next. And at some point in time, a human will ingest them and it just starts all over again. So when you look here, I'm not going to go into deep into the different types of cycles, life cycles. But what you'll see is that for the majority of those life cycles, there is some intermediate organism. Cow, a snail, um, a crawfish, you know, a fish, some other form there that different larval, larval stages will develop in before ending up back in a human where the sexual maturation and then sexual reproduction can occur. Over tens, if not hundreds of millions of years, the uh, different um, parasites 
have evolved and adapted for life inside a mammal. Okay, not specifically us humans, but in some form of a mammal. And they've also co-evolved the ability to survive in, you know, a bird or a cat, a cow or inside an arthropod, an insect, you know, a crayfish, things like that. When we look at these different um, parasitic worms, what we see is, well, they're multicellular and they do have some rudimentary organ systems there. They are greatly reduced, but functioning tissues, functioning systems are there for motility, for reproduction, for food processing, for nutrients. I mentioned before um, that we have to look for the definitive host. The definitive host is whichever host sexual reproduction occurs in. We like to think that if we're infected with something, we're the definitive host, but not always. Sometimes we're either one of the intermediaries or we are a dead end. The intermediate host, this is where larval stages will occur. Okay, the hallmark of a lot of these helmets is that they're going to be, you know, one, two, ten different larval stages, which could require anywhere from one, two, three, four different intermediate hosts between humans. Diagnostics, well, look at the stool sample. Look for either ova, the eggs, because for each of these helmets, their eggs are going to have a characteristic shape or characteristic structures. Or you could look for the actual parasites themselves. Sometimes people will pass out in the feces a whole worm or a whole or a large section of a tapeworm. And the patient will freak out when they look down there and there's something that looks like spaghetti swimming around in the toilet bowl. You can also look, uh, do a differential blood count. And you will notice that the eosinophils, uh, their numbers have skyrocketed. That right there is a clinical classical sign that the eosinophils are being activated and are going and they're going and going because there is something there, something that only they would respond to. Too. Also, we're going to have to get a really good history, patient history. Where have you been? Where have you traveled to? Have you eaten someplace? What have you been eating? Because as we're going to see, some of these nematodes, some of these, you know, worms can be associated with undercooked foods or foods that weren't prepared correctly. No vaccines, because um, we really don't mount much of an antibody response. I mean, we do mount one, but it really doesn't do much. T cells really don't do much and clearing out. So, because these things are multicellular, they're too big for a T cell and go and kill directly. So, what we look for is chemical treatments. What antibiotic, anti helminth drugs can you take that will, you know, stop motility of the worm? Stop motility, hopefully it'll get passed out with the feces. Stop motility and maybe it'll stop swimming through tissues long enough for the eosinophils to come and start doing damage, for the macrophages, neutrophils to come in and start clearing out the debris. There are numerous anti-helminth drugs out there. The problem is 
they are toxic to us. Different levels of toxicity in them. Because remember, this is a multicellular eukaryotic organism, just like we are.